So welcome back here again. Um, John McMaster will explain us some principles of uh, integrated circuit reverse engineering, and I think also show a website, um, which, uh, yeah, features all these information. Yep. All right. Hello, everyone. So uh, here we go. So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to start off with some background material, uh, basically uh, basics of CMOS, some logic gates, uh, so you learn how circuits are formed. And then we're going to go deeper and deeper to see how they're laid out, and then finally see some real transistor circuits and go through. Following that, uh, we're going to step more into the lab part of the presentation, where I'll show you how I actually got the images that we used in the first half. Uh, some people ask me why I do this. Uh, the original reason was I was working on a, um, a reverse engineer, software reverse engineering tool set as part of an uh, undergraduate project at uh, my university. And I found embedded systems a little more interesting because uh, I enjoyed kind of the hardware hands-on. But one of the problems I ran into a number of times was that I would get a uh, code-protected microcontroller and wasn't able to extract the firmware to do the analysis with it. So the original reason why I went into this was to learn how to get that firmware out of the microcontroller. Um, another big reason was I took some electrical engineering classes, but, and they talked about uh, transistors, but I really wouldn't know what a transistor looked like if I ever saw one. It was all very abstract. So part of this was really as a learning exercise to figure out what really was a transistor. And uh, I always like to always kind of jokingly say that I figure anything doing like this is probably better than watching TV. And uh, I've been encouraged to put a disclaimer in here because I will be talking about some potentially very dangerous chemical procedures and whatnot. Uh, please only do this, you know, if you're uh, comfortable and can do so safely. All right. So you might ask, what is a logic gate? This is kind of our starting point. So it's when you say, well, I want to, you know, um, set off the alarm if the is tampered or the window is broken or something like that in a car. You have some sort of condition. If uh, this and that or this or that uh, output some sort of uh, condition, true, false, whether it's happening or not. Um, and kind of the procession we talked about before is this is kind of the abstract idea that people want to realize, but there are many different ways that they can realize that. So we'll start off with the most general uh, principles, the uh, mathematical abstractions like and or, uh, and then talking about uh, logic techniques uh, to implement those, and then showing the lowest level details of that. And during this presentation, I'm going to use what's called the positive logic convention, which is the most common, and that is if you get a uh, logic low or zero, that that is a false logic, uh, and a high logic value would be true. And we represent that as one usually. The most fundamental logic block that you'll see is the inverter. That is, you take uh, one value in and you produce the opposite value out. So you get uh, false in, you get true out. Uh, you get true in, false out. False in, true out. Um, and there's kind of very basic truth table associated with it. And this is its schematic symbol that you'd see, for example, if you're doing a CD4000 or 7400 series, if you're familiar with those chip lines. Uh, the next kind of basic one you'll see is negative and. Uh, that is output basically um, a false condition if both inputs are set to true and everything else is evaluated to true. And so one question that people ask a lot is why do people introduce uh, negative and as kind of a basic logic function instead of and, which is more intuitive to people. And you'll kind of see this as we process through looking at some of the lower level details. Uh, and that's its schematic symbol in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, you'll find that there's a lot of parallels. The kind of the parallel of NAND is NOR. So that is uh, basically evaluate to true if neither input is set or false otherwise. And uh, kind of a good thing to keep in mind, because a lot of these parallels, is that this NAND and NOR are, they're in perspective to the positive logic convention. So for example, in this chart, if you look at it and you treat uh, the zeros as the true condition, that this actually forms a NAND gate. Uh, and we'll use this sort of um, duality, they call it, in a number of situations. So the next question.
understand, okay, so at a high level, how would someone implement some of these gates in an actual circuit? And one of the most common techniques that you'll hear today is called uh, CMOS. And so there are uh, NMOS, PMOS, or uh, BJT-based uh, TTL chips. Um, there are two basic types of switches, which we call complementary. There are the types that can switch um, a, basically a switch on when a high voltage is applied, and those are called the, um, the NFETs, and those that switch on when a lower voltage is applied, we call the PFETs. And we'll see a little bit more uh, in the next slide, uh, or a few slides more, how those are actually paired. But as logical one, you can see that the, uh, the lot to start with the logical one, for example, it's not going to turn on this transistor up here uh, because this is expecting a low voltage turn on. And it will turn on this transistor right here, uh, as indicated by this blue I'm using to represent the low voltage and the red for the higher voltages. And however, though, when we get this input one, it did not turn on this transistor. So although the, the voltage uh, made it partly up here, uh, it didn't actually get to the output. However, it did turn on this switch right here, so we were able to get a signal out. That is, uh, input zero, uh, inputs of 0 and 1 gave an output of uh, 1. Similarly, if we were to uh, put both logical 1s in, both of the transistors on the top are now off, and both transistors on the bottom, which are in series, uh, it can now conduct through both of them, so we will get a logical zero on the output. And uh, feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions. And just real briefly, we're going to go through the parallel. Uh, essentially, what you can see is all we've done is reversed which transistors are uh, connected to the high and low logic. If we put both zero in, a uh, very similar case, you can see that we get uh, both of these uh, PFETs turned on uh, and voltage, high voltage on the output. Uh, 
And similar sort of case if we apply both logical ones in. Both of these transistors on the bottom turned in in parallel. It doesn't really matter. Uh, either one would have been fine. And they both feed the output. Oops. All right. So now we're going to go a little bit lower details, is start getting into the actual semiconductors. And the most basic that you'll ever see is the diode. And what they talked about is the uh, doping. And basically what that is, is you take uh, some, some uh, called charge neutral silicon, that is sort of pure silicon, and they'll apply some small impurities to give it sort of uh, positive or negatively charged parts. And uh, typically, you'll see things like uh, phosphorus or boron would be common. And what you see, if you just have this kind of this natural state, is um, in order to conduct current, you need something with some charge, either what they call uh, holes or electrons. And what will happen, though, is if you have holes and electrons next to each other, they will cancel out and form a neutral region, which you can't carry current across. And so this is in this current state, with no voltage applied to it, at uh, no current flow, which probably isn't too surprising. Um, but even if, yeah, so. But if you, if you did, for example, was you added some uh, positive voltage to the left side and some negative voltage to the right side, um, and you reach a certain threshold, about 0.7 is common, what'll happen is you'll get two positive charges next to each other and two negative charges next to each other, and the uh, like charges repel, you'll push them close enough that the electrons will sort of be able to tunnel over and be able to cross the neutral area, which will get very small. And so we have some conduction. And it's worth mentioning, of course, then, if you were to try to apply voltage in the reverse direction, you would get um, opposite charges to attract, and you'd actually widen the neutral region, and you wouldn't get any conduction. So the reason why we care about this is because it's the same uh, principle that a transistor works on. However, instead of controlling the charge through two terminals, we're going to add a third terminal, which will essentially switch the current between the two other terminals. So this is what we call the gate. The gate is the terminal that controls whether the transistor is on or off. And the other two terminals we call the source and the drain. The source is co uh, called as such because it's the source of the charge carriers. So for example, in a P MOSFET, and the P stands for positive, uh, that would be where you would connect the positive voltage because uh, that is where we're getting the holes from, a hole being a lack of electron. Electrons are negative, so that's a positive charge. And those travel through the transistor and exit through the drain. Similarly, in the case of an N MOSFET, the uh, negative potential would be applied over here uh, and travel out through the drain. And there is a concept of what they call the threshold voltage, which is the actual voltage where we start getting conduction. For our purposes of this talk, we're going to pretty much ignore most analog effects. So you can pretty much assume that if we have the lower voltage range, that it will be, uh, for example, an N MOSFET, that it'll be off. And the higher voltage, it'll be on. And you will never encounter the in-between states. We'll have to wonder, well, is it on or is it off? Um, and just a little bit you'll see here is the way that they manufacture this usually is they start off with a uh, basically a, uh, a pure wafer. They'll add some impurities to it. Uh, P, the positive dope wafers is common. And you can see they added these N plus basically means um, negatively doped areas. So we have two negatively doped areas, a positive area in the center. And then we're creating the, a little gap of um, negative charge here by applying some of this voltage to the gate. Uh, and this is sort of a capacitor, so we have a charge transfer that forms the ch conduction channel. A uh, little more detail, though, because we'll see this coming up in a second. Um, the real devices, though, are typically made in, uh, at least the devices we care about, are made in uh, large chips. And in the other device, it was more of what we call discrete transistor, like, you know, like a TO92, the little small electronic things you pick up. Some of the problems that you'll run into trying to operate on a real chip, or a larger chip, I should say, is that you don't basically want a crosstalk between the multiple transistors. And so the way that they do this is they will take the source and add this uh, other terminal they call the body terminal, which is really what the gate uh, is um, conducting charge with. And by doing this, if we have a, uh, a negative potential here, and I'm sorry, a 
N-doped region here and a P-doped region here were, oops, I'm sorry, were forming a diode, just like we had before, and that keeps all of the transistors isolated from each other because no current can uh, flow uh, across, uh, we call it a reverse bias diode, and that's when we widen the neutral region so no current could flow. Um, okay. So going a little bit deeper now, so that was kind of a side view, but when people are actually designing chips, they don't care so much about the side view so much as the, uh, top, lo uh, you know, the top looking view of the chip. So the gate material is typically made of what we call polysilicon, and you can see right here, so the green represents the uh, positive doped areas. Uh, they might call it diffusion or implant, uh, depending on the technology used. Uh, that is to make the chip. Oops. Uh, and so, for example, this PFET, you can see we have one connection here, uh, another connection down here, and the gate comes across, and what happens is, the way they manufacture this, is the, the gate is placed down first, uh, and then they, uh, bom they will do, uh, add this, um, this green positive area, and the gate will block the uh, positive area from uh, diffusing and producing the charge carriers in the chip. So it will, it will actually have a negative uh, region underneath there, kind of like we saw in the picture. And we have the same sort of concept on the other side to produce the uh, end transistor. And you can see that we have, by alternating these and forming, this is what we call a well, that we can have uh, both types of transistors on the same wafer. <coughs> and a few other things is this blue area represents metal, which is typically used to do the, uh, the actual connections on the chip. Uh, one thing you might ask is why not do that with poly, uh, polysilicon, because that's what we're using right here. Polysilicon is a poor conductor, so it is used for some uh, connections on a chip, but only in very short distances. And the connections between layers are uh, often referred to as contacts or vias. Uh, I think contact might be a little more common, but I call them vias here, mostly because it took up less space on the slides. Uh, and one other note is uh, in the body terminal diagram, if you were paying attention, you might see that it said uh, P plus and it said P substrate. There's, once again, kind of ignoring some of the analog effects, there's uh, different concentrations used for different parts. So when they do this body terminal, uh, essentially, for some reasons, trying to eliminate some analog effects, they play around a little bit with the doping. And the reason why this is important is because we'll actually see this on the chips. Uh, when people are designing these chips, there's a couple different mythologies they can use. In the early days, people would actually sit out by hand and lay out, say, well, I need a logic circuit that does this, so I'm gonna place uh, this transistor here, here, and I'm gonna custom fit them exactly to my application. But as chips grew larger and companies wanted to reduce their time to market, they realized this was not the quickest way to design chips, although maybe the most efficient. So instead what they do is they say, well, uh, we're gonna take a small team of people that are gonna design a few small, well-known, well-characterized logic cells. For example, we talked about the NAND and the NOR gates earlier. And they'll say, well, this is the inductance, the capacitance of that. And as designer, it'll be easy for you to just add some wires between a few of these circuits. And by they, and because most logic designers, just like if you're using uh, like the 7400 series chips, you know how to place wires between the chips, although you don't necessarily care exactly how they're implemented within the epoxy. And so what we'll see a lot of times are actually these so-called standard logic cells, which are the prefabricated um, transistors, essentially, that is, um, templated transistors, and then the actual end user will wire up some metal on top to form their actual application. And one important point that we'll see a few times is that it turns out for one reason or another that the positively doped transistors, that is the PMOS, are actually a little bit slower than the NMOS for the same size. And after you work out a bunch of factors, uh, it turns out if you make the uh, PMOS transistors slightly larger, that you can match them in speed to the NMOS. And so this will give us a way to identify which transistors are PMOS and which ones are NMOS. Without doing, and I should mention, there are other ways that you can do it to get more um, concrete results. Uh, if, for example, it's unclear from the way the circuit, uh, you use techniques they call staining, which are specialized uh, silicon etch techniques, but usually that's not necessary. <laughs> 
All right, so now we're going to get, this is our first pictures of a real uh, circuit. And so this will be the inverter circuit we talked about before, very basic. And uh, most, if not all, I'd say most of the pictures in this presentation are from an RSA secure ID in case people are curious. And I'll talk a little bit more about how these images were prepared in a little bit. So the first thing that we get uh, at the lowest level is that we get the, we call it the active area. That is the area where we actually had the, uh, the doping of the positive and negative uh, car charge carriers. So the most important parts uh, right here, so this would be, since this is larger than this area, this forms the positively doped, which is represented in green, and this yellow part down here is the uh, negatively doped, which is usually represented in yellow. And we had the uh, body terminal earlier, uh, where they call guard bars sometimes in these uh, standard cells, is the other part right here, which basically uh, keeps the wells isolated. That is, so that the transistors don't short each other out. Going up a little bit higher, uh, we see right here, so this right here is the polysilicon, which is the so-called gate. And you can see these are the, um, these are the charged regions, the P-doped regions, with the polysilicon gate in the middle, and same sort of idea down here. So over here, I've drawn this out, stacking it on top of the previous layer we have. And you can't see it so much right here, but you can see it in some other pictures. You can kind of just tell sometimes just based on um, what you expect designers to do. There's a contact here that is a via, and you can see a few of them over here, which have been put over here. The next layer uh, is what they call M1, or metal one, being the lowest metal layer in the chip. And typic, not necessarily, but oftentimes, uh, metal one is reserved for the standard cells, whereas the higher level metal layers are related, are up to the actual uh, end user to use. So in this particular case, for example, um, I don't know how easy it is to see, there's this sort of light, uh, darker blue right here, which is this right here. This is the M1, and you can see a little bit right here, this is M2, or second metal. And these little vias right here, which we'll see in a little bit more in a bit, these are essentially what the user, end user cares about for the input and output to the standard logic cell. Everything below this is a black box to them. They just know that if they connect some metal here, they get an input, and a uh, little metal on the other part, they get the output. So drawing a little schematic now as this right here. So because we have a P region right here um, and with a uh, polysilicon crossing it, that forms a P transistor. And down here with the N transistor, which I've laid out over here, the gate connecting them over here. Uh, and typically, if you only have um, a signal driving into gates, that makes it an input into a circuit. And on the right side, this uh, M1, the metal one, is connecting these two sides of the transistors together. So this is forming the complementary pair to drive the output. So that forms our inverter circuit. And it's also worth mentioning, just to understand these a little bit better, just for reference. So we talked a little bit about the, the P and the N forming the isolation. So these little symbols right here, which I think you can see the mouse, you can see the mouse, is that this is referring to the, body, the diode formed by the body terminal. So you can think of it, um, basically this is the main P right here with a little bit of the N uh, in the body, and that forms the, or the well, and that forms a diode. So something a little more complicated, uh, let's do a four input NAND circuit, NAND gate. So looking at the lower levels, we have the same sort of idea. We have some polysilicon going up here and down here. So these form uh, uh, eight transistors in total, four P up here and four N down here. And these little blocks right here form the, uh, where we put the contacts or vias up to the next level. Uh, same deal with the guard bars. Uh, looking at the next layer, you can see the metal here uh, for the, uh, I'm sorry, I might have skipped over this a little bit. These are the um, supply rails. Let me back up real quick. Uh, oops. These up here and down here are the uh, supply rails uh, for the circuits. And typically they're put at the top and bottom, uh, so it's very regular, and so the standard logic cells can be uh, daisy chained together. So for example, if you want to make two inverters, uh, they're designed such that the metal is just overlapping so that it all, all the power supplies, the supply rails will connect directly together. So going back to this then, uh, rails here, and 
laying down the metal, once again, because these are larger up here, this is the P-doped, this is the N-doped. Uh, you can see some of the M1 right here. Uh, and with the, uh, the M2 uh, contacts right here and the M2 itself, which I've shown over here. So laying this out more in sort of a schematic friendly fashion, uh, we can see because these over here are going directly into these polysilicon gates, that these are the inputs that are seen over here. And then the output is a combination of all of these gates in series down here, which output over here. And then a few of these right here we can see are essentially putting the, uh, the positive supply rail in parallel as necessary to form the uh, AND function. And then those two are tied together on this right side so that the output can swing in both directions. So those are kind of the more basic circuits. So here's something with a little more kick to it. And we'll go through this in a number of steps. Uh, so lower levels, uh, same sort of idea. Um, but there are a few differences here that we didn't see before. So one of them, for example, you can see we have the guard bar over here. But you also see a little few splotches. Uh, right here and here. And essentially, because it's a larger circuit and you get certain problems, you have to distribute the uh, body terminal into a larger area. So those are making sure that we don't get latch up or other sort of shorting problems. Uh, basically, this follows through. You can see a lot of the contacts. Some of this right here is uh, some of M1, that is the metal, that didn't get completely etched off. Uh, you can kind of ignore that, or you can look at some other of the higher level pictures to figure out which components you kind of need to ignore. And that's one of the big things is that there's a lot of sample preparation involved. So it can really make or break a project uh, depending on how good of images you're able to acquire from the sample preparation. Uh, looking a little bit more, so this is the metal layers, uh, which I've transposed on the right. Uh, I have the supply rails uh, shifted a little bit right here. but. Same sort of idea, you, know, you see the P is larger over here, which means that this is our uh, positive voltage rail and the negative over here, and wired up SO over here. Uh, and a few of them, for example, right here, it's a little bit hard to tell, but this goes back to uh, what you might call design rule check or figuring out what people are really doing. Sometimes it might be kind of obscured. You can't exactly verify what the chip is doing, but if you're not working on an obfuscated or obscurified chip, that is somewhere where uh, someone has done anti-reverse engineering. You can usually tell uh, what the circuit is trying to do. And you can make little leaps to say, well, if we have one wire going here and another wire here, there's a good chance that there's a via in between them that connects them. So this would be our first pass at it. Uh, you oops. you uh, take all these and you say, well, we've got a transistor here, a transistor here of this type. And we have these wires. So it gives you this sort of transistor level over here. But most people, if they look at that, they wouldn't go, aha, that's a, they would need to do a little bit more simplification to um, figure out actually what it is. So the easiest part is, um, or I say the easiest part, the first thing that makes, to help simplify this is to start looking, well, what are the complementary pairs that are most likely used together? And start figuring out what we can simplify. So these are kind of the basic building blocks and I've put net numbers uh, as kind of a reference so that we can go back and forth and patch them back into the original circuit. The easiest targets are probably the inverters, simply because two transistors, they're easy to recognize uh, and very easy to take out. So these are all fairly straightforward uh, translations to the circuits below. Uh, the next one that's a little more complicated is trying to figure out, well, what are these guys right here, for example? And you might kind of look at them, and um, what you might get a little confused, because you say, well, this forms kind of a loop. Uh, so a few questions. One of them is, you know, which side is the input, which one's the output? Um, and is this really complementary? Uh, because a lot of times for this sort of circuit, you, you might need more drivers, um, something connected to positive and negative rail. So the first step to kind of look at this, you'll notice, is that there's an inverter that we simplified out here. And so if you look then now, the uh, net 5 and net 4 are now uh, what you might call out of phase. That is, if one of the nets is 0, the other one is 1. If one is 0, uh, the other one is 1. Uh, sorry, if one is 0, the other one's 1. If one is 1, the other one is 0. Uh, 
So that helps us a lot in simplifying this. So let's think about this for a second. So this right here is a N MOSFET, and this is a P MOSFET. And so if we were to, just thinking about this, there is only one possible state where this can be on. So for example, if we have a, um, a positive signal coming in here, this N MOSFET is gonna turn on, and this is gonna get inverted here, so we got a negative signal, so this is gonna turn on, or I'm sorry, uh, so this will turn on, but um, it doesn't, if we, if we go the other direction now, if we have negative in here, this transistor will be off and it'll get inverted here and this transistor will be off. So what does that mean? In one state we have the circuit conducting and the other circuit, in the other combination, circuit is not conducting. So we basically have a tri-state portion of the circuit. That is, you apply an input, uh, which control is right here, and when the signal is applied, that it will propagate a signal, and otherwise it'll eliminate it. And if you step through kind of doing a truth table, you will arrive that this is a non-inverting tri-state. We have a similar sort of concept uh, for Q8, Q7. It's basically the same thing. And you'll notice that uh, kind of fudging a little bit, uh, I just simplified this to uh, node net, um, net five over here, and I kind of eliminated net four. For our purposes, we're going for a logical equivalence, uh, and so that's kind of some hand-waving there. All right, so what happened here? So we substitute in all of those, and we, um, we arrive at this circuit. So what do we have here? So an input that controls a couple of tri-states, and the other one I should mention was inverting, but oops. Uh, and we've got some sort of loop right here. Okay, so first clue, when you see a loop, you should start thinking we have some sort of storage element. Uh, if you guys seen the flip-flops, for example, before, you know, two NOR or NAND gates kind of coupled into each other. But we also have this kind of control right here. So a lot of times that implement, that um, would be some sort of latched uh, on a clock or something of that sort. And so if you look, what'll happen is if this input is, um, if this input is low, if what I'm calling P5 earlier is low, what will happen is we have two inverters essentially and they'll go in their merry way. So for example, if we have high here, this will get inverted to low, which will get inverted to high. But if this clock signal then, um, I'm sorry, that, that's when clock is high. So then if clock goes low, because they have this inversion here, then this chain is broken and this is no longer driving this area. But at the same time, this, uh, MUX when clock is high will get activated. So um, you can think of this kind of as a, uh, as a MUX, uh, which would be another way to simplify it. So now instead what's happening, if instead of the feedback coming in here, we have this data line. And this will start going through here. And then at some point in the future, the clock line is gonna go low again, so that this will start conducting and this will be cut off. And then this, will, this data then will propagate through here and form the uh, data stored in the memory circuit. And so I believe that's called a uh, negative edge uh, flip-flop, then is essentially the circuit we get. Because then while this is high, uh, this output Q not over here is an inverted version of our data. And then what the uh, negative edge, that is the falling clock, uh, the circuit will latch in the value that we had on data. And it is worth mentioning kind of a gotcha is that while most of the time that the metal two is not used for connection, if we go back a little bit, you will see that this P2, P3 right here was actually part of the cell itself. And you will not get the right result if you don't consider this part of the cell. However, this section over the right is what the user was actually using the cell for, and that's their own routing. Uh, just kind of um, a few basic notes. I mentioned a little bit about the chaining of the standard cells together. You can actually kind of see this right here where we have uh, Maybe a couple of repeats, you can see the cell right here, right here, uh, is used twice right next to each other, and these metal is continuous. Uh, and this makes for very clean layout in general. Uh, and same sort of idea with the um, guard bars. And also, in some circumstances, uh, for example, if you see SRAM, they have to do some special tricks, and uh, you might get some circuits in parallel to drive more current through them. All right, so that was kind of the first part where we talked about how do you take these uh, images and uh, form them into uh, an actual schematic. But that doesn't actually tell you how to obtain the images, which is a known, uh, known issue in itself. 
So the first step you usually start with is you'll get some sort of maybe PCB you want to scrap or reverse engineer or whatever. And typically I'll take a, a heat gun to it and depending on how much I care, I might be very delicate with tweezers or I might just hammer on it until all the ICs come off. Uh, the next step is we call it decapsulation or uh, my people call it decap uh, for decapsulate for short. And that is the process of uh, removing the epoxy from the chip. And there's a lot of different techniques you can do for this. Uh, most chips that you're going to encounter are epoxy, and the most common techniques for working on epoxy chips would be hot sulfuric and nitric, or nitric acid, which I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, some of the other ones, of course, if you just get like a metal can like you might see on a high-end CPU, you can just dremel that open, or sometimes you can desolder it. Uh, and glass chips, like you'll see, uh, for ex glass ceramic, for example, uh, EPROMs is a common example. Uh, oftentimes you can just kind of melt those open, although there's some fine points. Uh, one of the such methods that you'll see used is with sulfuric acid. Um, one of the nice things about this is the chemicals are easy to get. So as a uh, miner, for example, I wasn't allowed to buy muriatic acid at the hardware store, but I was able to buy drain cleaner at the uh, other hardware, or that even the same hardware store, which turns out to be 98% uh, or so sulfuric acid which is probably much stronger than the uh, muriatic acid, but it was easy to get and it's just on the shelves. Uh, but you do have to be a little bit careful because uh, some of them might be lye or others. But of course, if you have access to it, uh, chemical suppliers uh, in the US, uh, due to diesel, I think they're pronounced, uh, uh, will sell you sulfuric acid pretty inexpensively and ship it to uh, residential addresses. It's generally good, what I use it for is bulk epoxy removal. So for example, uh, this uh, big, big beaker right here uh, has a bunch of the secure IDs that I was collecting. And if I was doing kind of a quick pinpoint, I might use nitric, which is sometimes quicker. But if I don't mind just kind of uh, letting it stew for a while, uh, I might just dump in a bunch of sulfuric acid and let it cook. Uh, some of the disadvantages, though, of course, is sulfuric acid is especially corrosive to human skin. I know because I have a scar on my right hand, <laughs> not from the chip work, but from some other chemistry stuff. Uh, and you need a fairly high temperature. Uh, whereas nitric, you might be lower, um, somewhere in this, let's say, 70, 90 centigrade range. Uh, the sulfuric, you need at the very least 150, uh, 200 centigrade is probably better. And you can see, for example, it produces some, I don't know how clear this see, you can see this, but it produces some very heavy, very heavy corrosive vapors. Uh, you can mitigate this a lot by covering it while you're working with it or refluxing it. Uh, but a lot of times you kind of want to check on it. Uh, so for example, right here, I have a Teflon beaker, which I've uh, drilled some holes in the side and put a Teflon wire through. And so I can put a chip in there, uh, dunk it in the acid, let it stew for a little bit, and check it out. Because the problem you can see over here is that this solution turns very, very black. You can't see on it at all. You have no idea by visual inspection if the chip is done. Uh, one way you can mitigate this though, uh, as far as the fumes, is you could just let it cool down and hope for the best. But you will get some problems. If you put a chip in too long, uh, you'll tend to actually corrode it a little bit, which I'll show a little bit later. The other really common technique is using uh, nitric acid. Um, it varies wildly uh, what you need to do with it, depending on the concentration. So 70%, for example, which is what uh, tends to be a little easier to get, uh, down to maybe about 60%, is uh, you definitely need to heat it. But uh, if you have 90%, so-called the fuming nitric acids, such as white fuming or red fuming nitric acid, you actually don't even need to heat it. In fact, it'll even self-heat, and if you're not careful, can even more or less explode uh, just left at room temperature. So that has to be watched a little more carefully. Uh, but I know some people what they'll do is, and I've done this before, is if you just throw a chip in, a little uh, vial of it, and come back a few hours later or even a day, depending on the size of the chip, it'll be decapped and you didn't need to have any heat and it'll put off a lot less uh, fumes. Um, but you do have to be a little careful, especially if you're using the, uh, the lower concentrations with heat because uh, as the uh, acid eats the epoxy, it's gonna lower in concentration, and this will have a tendency to actually uh, corrode the chip more than when it was at a higher concentration. Also using the higher concentration is good for a number of other reasons, such that you will tend to uh, put less stress on the chip, 
by working at a lower temperature and for less time in general. So kind of a few examples of this. Uh, the, this is the same chip in both these vials, and I, um, I put in there a room temperature, one with uh, some white fuming nitric acid, the other with 70%, uh, and I could actually visually see the chip uh, disintegrating on the left uh, as soon as I put it in. Well, so the one on the right, even after, this is after about 24 hours, but I don't think it changed much after about an hour. Uh, only the leads had basically been eaten and the epoxy, the chip number was still readable. So even just a little bit higher concentration has a profound effect. And this on the left kind of shows you a standard, kind of what 70% uh, heated might look like. You'll get this kind of little small bubble, uh, greenish solution typically from the copper being dissolved. And you'll see this uh, environmentally friendly red toxic gas forming above, which I don't recommend you breathe. <laughs> Uh, I use uh, kind of, I work in kind of a semi-outside area. I uh, work with a couple filters, uh, potassium permanganate uh, pre-filter basically. I'll oftentimes put these in um, kind of a, a jointed glass or flask. So that'll go through that, and then that goes through activated carbon filter uh, for the outlet gas. And by the time it goes through that, it's scrubbed pretty well uh, to be released. Uh, the other good thing you can do with, with the high concentration nitric and the dilute a little bit that's a lot easier than sulfuric is you can do what uh, you might call for live analysis. So the chips you saw before were just, you know, statically taking pictures, you know, no current running through the system. We just want to look at it and see what we can figure out from that. But for certain applications, it's a lot easier if you can actually microprobe the circuit. And uh, for example, if it decrypts its memory at runtime, or you'd like to uh, understand what's actually going through a part of the circuit, you will need to keep the uh, IC intact within the circuit. So there's a couple different techniques you can do this, but the most common is to use um, the fuming nitric acid. It helps a little bit to mill out a cavity and the top of the chip, uh, not strictly necessary, but you'll generally do it quicker uh, as far as time on the chip, which means that you'll put less stress on the chip and you also will typically remove um, less of the uh, epoxy overall if you direct it more with one of these milled cavities. One of the problems you can run into, for example, if you just keep throwing more acid on it, is you will collapse the lead frame, and uh, that can be, that's a very bad thing because the chip will kind of fall apart, and it'll be very difficult to reattach the so-called bond wires that uh, connect from the outside world to the chip. Uh, and typically, uh, a dropper is a good choice to dispense it, uh, and you run this on a hot plate. And put a little few drops on, uh, then wash it in acetone. Now, I'd also give a little more caution with that, too. If you just flat out combine uh, fuming nitric acid and acetone, it will probably explode. Um, but typically, by the time you've let it sit on the chip for a little bit, uh, it's more or less uh, neutral. So if you wash in the acetone, you'll have a very minor reaction, but not enough to be dangerous. And uh, these three aren't the same chips, but gives you kind of an idea of what it might look like. And you can still see the epoxy right here. These are the gold bond wires. I think this was an XC2018 FPGA. Uh, kind of miscellaneous things, uh, especially for some of these larger chips, uh, it can help to uh, dremel underneath it. They have what, I've seen a lot of different names for it, the paddle, uh, paddle, the carrier island, or a few other names that's used to uh, support the uh, dye before they uh, put the epoxy around it. This is oftentimes made of uh, copper or aluminum and is at least the size of the chip, usually a lot larger, a little larger. And so what you can do is you can shave off a little bit from under the chip, get kind of a uh, basic idea of where the chip actually is in the package, and then kind of cut it into pieces. And this will save you considerable working time. Of course, if it's a very valuable chip, you probably don't want to do this because it has its own uh, potential risk, you know, cutting into the chip or whatnot. Uh, but if you're just kind of messing around, this can save you a lot of time. Uh, also, one thing you might run into is uh, some chips, for one reason or another, will use some copper. And uh, the most common way of dealing with that is to use a 90% um, uh, fuming nitric acid with 10% sulfuric. Essentially, what this does is the sulfuric will uh, passivate the chip, and uh, I'm sorry, will passivate the copper while the nitric will eat on it. You'll still get a little bit of corrosion, but it'll be much, much less than you would have gotten otherwise. Also, if you have a chip that you would like to be able to uh, microprobe, I would suggest that you try to get two samples if possible. Uh, 
because while they're still in the packages like this, each time you clean it, you will keep getting a runoff from the epoxy and you'll get dirty images. They might not look bad, but you'll get streaks and other little defects on the chip. So if you can, try to keep one for microprobing and image one separately that you can clean really well. Uh, and this is an example of what happened when a chip was in sulfuric too long. Uh, you can see that this whole area was supposed to be covered in aluminum, which is what this is right here, uh, one of the metals commonly used in chips, and you can see it kind of seeped over. Uh, even, if you're, even if you're being a little careful, you can also get uh, defects, and this is what they call the overglass, which is kind of a silicon dioxide protective layer over the chip. So you might see a little pitting across the chip, and that's not something you can do much, but by keeping it in the solution for the least time possible, you can uh, mitigate this damage. So the next thing will happen is uh, you might photograph that, which we'll talk a lot about in a little bit. Uh, and, uh, but you also might want to go a little bit deeper. So for example, this right here is kind of a composite photograph where you can see the top metal on the left. Uh, it was, uh, some layers were removed down a little bit more and finally down to the substrate where we have the active areas that we saw earlier. So this is about how to get down to produce these sort of photographs. The most common techniques that you'll see is uh, variations of using this chemical called hydrofluoric acid, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, lapping, which is uh, basically precision grinding, so what you can think about, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And there's also so-called reactive uh, ion etching, which I think someone earlier at the conference mentioned a little bit about, uh, which is basically you take, um, you take some special gases, you uh, put some RF over them to kind of ionize them, and you very precisely remove layers from the chip. I've never done that, so I can't really talk too much about it, uh, but I'm told it works well, but it requires a little more equipment. And kind of in a related field is what we call uh, staining, which is basically selective edge. So an example of this is, you've probably heard of ROMs, uh, you know, the read-only memories, uh, for example, in the game cartridge. And the earliest ones would use metal to connect the, uh, the positive and negative rails to each of the little data bits. And so you could actually read these out uh, with a microscope. But as time went on, partially for manufacturing reasons and par partly to make reverse engineering harder, they switched to using uh, implant method, for example, which is where you uh, basically diffuse uh, different uh, negative positive impurities into the chip and to make different conductive paths. And oftentimes, those are very difficult to read optically. However, because they are slightly more positive negative than, than the other, you can use certain chemical techniques that will favor etching positive or negative areas, and you will get a kind of an outlined form, which not, might not be super easy to read, but if you use certain microscopy techniques, you can pick it out and read it optically. So the first technique is using the so-called uh, hydrofluoric acid, or HF. Uh, it's worth mentioning that this, match, this will etch uh, metal in the silicon dioxide, which is used for that protective overglass on the top, as well as kind of filler. Uh, so for example, if you had a so-called planarized chip, which is they take one layer and then they, uh, they kind of even it out so it's flat, and then they deposit another layer, uh, a lot of times the filler will be something like silicon dioxide. Uh, but it will not etch the substrate. So we had those photos earlier, um, for example, right here. This was etched with hydrofluoric acid because it's fairly easy to just uh, throw it in the tank, let it etch for a while, and then you'll end up with a picture like this. It's fairly easy to obtain this image without any damage to the substrate. Um, one of the big things you have to work, watch out for is that if you have any contamination at all on the chip, that it will block the acid etch and you'll get very poor results. So the biggest thing I would say to remember is to clean the dyes well before trying to etch them. Uh, also, uh, general note, the reason why a lot of people don't like working with this is because this chemical is toxic. And I'm not talking about like kind of manufacturer disclaimer, like seriously hospitalized if, if you spill some on yourself in a significant concentration. Uh, in fact, uh, even the low concentration versions, which are sold in the U.S., are not legal to sell in the uh, U uh, European Union, I believe. For, the, for example, they use it in these uh, rust remover, which is a common source for hobbyists obtaining this. Uh, one of the other things, too, is because you are etching down and 
you have to watch it very closely. It is very easy to let it sit for a little while and have it go too far. So for example, um, these polysilicon, which is maybe what I'd want in this photo, if you let it sit for a little bit longer, it would etch under the silicon dioxide under it, and although it won't technically destroy the polysilicon, you will actually see it float away in the solution and ruin your images. Uh, and to some extent, it's uneven. Uh, you can see these two are supposed to be the same logic cell, but there's some differences with metal here. Uh, in part, this is due because I wasn't using a so-called buffered version, which is a little more chemically stable. Uh, I just haven't had a need so much yet to play around with those to get a little more accurate on the etching, but I believe you can get it a little more accurate. Another uh, technique uh, that's less toxic is to use um, so-called lapping, which is essentially precision polishing. And what this typically involves is this is a, basically a lapping machine. Uh, it's designed for, uh, for stonework, uh, but I was using it for chips. And you take this solution on a spinning pad uh, called colloidal silica, which is basically a suspension of silicon dioxide as an, an abrasive in a water solution. And this is kind of a, uh, both a mechanical and a chemical process. There's a little bit of chemical reaction. And this is, in fact, what they use to make chips. So it also works good for, um, for uh, taking them apart. And it tends to give pretty even results, but it takes a little bit of practice. You can also get some special fixtures, which help with that. Uh, and these chips that I showed are not planarized. Uh, you can tell, for example, looking at this, planarized being the ones that are built layer by layer. So if you look, you can see defects in the second metal here from the M1 that's below it. If it was a planarized chip, you wouldn't see these little ridges. But it still works okay on the uh, non-planarized chips. Uh, you can see one of the issues of this is the first time I tried this, my finger got very agitated because you're doing this kind of semi-corrosive solution, and uh, it's often easiest just to hold the chip in place with your finger. Uh, but I tried it again after that, and I haven't had any problems since. But you're working with you know, a large spinning part, so you have to be careful you know, not to get your finger jammed or anything like that. Uh, generally speaking, it's good. You've got to make sure you're able to clean the chips to get quality results. CMP is fairly messy. That's that process, the lapping. So it was, in fact, rejected from early semiconductor manufacturing because I didn't know how to clean the chips well enough afterwards. Typical uh, process would be to uh, use ultrasound with acetone, then some sudsy water followed by acetone again, and that will tend to keep a chip pretty clean. Uh, biggest things I would say to watch out for is to use quality acetone uh, from a reputable chemical supplier. Uh, hardware acetone tends to be unreliable. I find that it gets impurities maybe from the container in it. Uh, and gently wiping also uh, helps to remove some things. The next part is that you need to be able to actually assemble these images. I have a uh, computer-controlled microscope that I basically built off of Craigslist and uh, eBay, running some custom software, which is open source on GitHub, if you'd like to use it. Uh, the most important thing I would say is get good quality objectives. Uh, it seems to, I've generally found it tends to influence the quality the most. And so you get these very regular images, uh, for example, from the CNC. The next part is that you need to uh, stitch them together. And I use the, uh, basically the Pano tools, uh, open source chain to do that. Over time, I've developed some uh, special wrapper scripts to help um, improve the process. For example, I use uh, the XY CNC, which allows me to make some assumptions about positions of the images which significantly increases the accuracy of the uh, stitching process, as well as the speed. Um, the one part that I haven't gotten so well is this optimization. It's basically saying, well, we've matched these two images together right here, and these two images right here, and these two images right here, and these here. But then you kind of have to say, well, this one said this image should be a little bit over here, and this matching over here said the image should be a little bit over here. So kind of a matching problem to figure out what is the least constrained position to put all the images together. And that's uh, we might call a hard problem. It's very computationally expensive. Uh, so that's currently kind of a um, straight stress point for me. And uh, generally, I produce these Google Maps sort of outputs because they tend to be very accessible to people. They don't need you know hundreds of gigabytes of RAM or whatever to uh, load up the images, even if they're very large and can be accessed from a web browser. So kind of finishing up, uh, for future work, what I'd like to do is learn a little bit more about automated analysis. Since a lot of what I was doing was kind of playing around with the uh, bare principles, uh, 
uh, I wasn't as interested in learning to automate things because if you don't understand it as a fundamental level, it's very difficult to use automated tools to uh, help you. Um, there's an existing tool called Degate that works on the so-called standard cell-based ones, but uh, does not work on the, um, the typical ones like you'd find on older chips, which are all hand laid out. Uh, I've also had a few problems with stability with Degate, but uh, it's something I'd like to play with a little more. Also, one reason why I didn't understand the algorithms behind it, so I'm learning OpenCV to try to help me figure out how those image matching algorithms work so I can better apply it. And there's quite a lot of challenges with this. You'll get a lot of image defects. Uh, and some of those, like a human does, you get heuristics. Like I said, if you have a wire here, wire here, you can make some assumptions. Uh, but those can be difficult to uh, incorporate in with the image recognition algorithms. And one pitfall you can get is that it's easy to try to overtune for a specific system. And so it's very hard to make uh, generic tools. And uh, finally, the other thing I'm working on is to, I just generally enjoy taking pictures. Uh, so I've been trying to streamline the photo photography process a little bit more by adding autofocus. So that's one project I'm working on right now. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed and learned a little bit. Uh, you can contact me at that address or see some information on our wiki, uh, which gives a little more detail on these techniques as well as a uh, number of sample chip images. I'd also like to thank uh, Andrew Zonenberg for helping collaborate, as well as a few of the schematics, help with some schematics, and uh, Alex Rodocha for some of the web hosting for Silicon Prawn in our lease. Thank you very much. So thanks to our speaker. Are there questions? Uh, you shown uh, an, uh, an example of uh, image capture uh, with an optical uh, microscope, but that, what about uh, designs which uh, use uh, more uh, fine uh, sure. circuit? So, so most of my interest, a lot of my interest in this has been educational. Uh, so I've been perfectly satisfied with a lot of the older chips. And it turns out that even a number of chips today, because what happens is Intel says, well, we would like the cutting edge technology, so we're gonna throw away our old fabrication equipment. And so somebody says, well, I'm a discount IC manufacturer, so I'm gonna take that uh, old fabrication equipment and still make uh, what we call large process technology chips today. So it turns out there's still a lot of modern chips that use uh, technology that's visible under the microscope. And just as kind of an educational exercise, there's so many chips out there already that are accessible to me that I haven't found the need so much to go to SEMS or other uh, high resolution techniques to look at those uh, smaller chips. Are there more questions? Yes. Microphone is on its way. Yeah, I really enjoyed your talk. Have you done other work with ICs, like design from the ground up, or I mean, how did you get interested? Uh, so I said, kind of, kind of the basic thing was that I was, um, I was interested in this from university uh, because I took some uh, EE classes, graduated with computer systems, computer science, but um, I kind of felt it was too abstract, and I wanted a little more information, even in a lot of the more advanced uh, senior courses or. Um, I say master's courses, they didn't quite go down to say, well, this is what the transistor really looks like at the end of the day. Uh, so I thought this would be kind of a good exercise. When I was in college, though, I found it difficult to uh, gain access to the tools to do this sort of research. So unfortunately, it wasn't until after I graduated that I kind of had a little more uh, money to spend on it, but now I'm limited on time. Uh, but uh, I've learned a lot doing what I've been able to and what time I've had available, so it's been kind of an enjoyable experience for me. Very cool, thanks. Okay, and I think that was it. Thank you again. Uh, one quick announcement. Uh, this evening, we will try to gather everybody in the uh, exhibition area, so maybe we can uh, go to get, grab something to eat or to drink or something. Do something together, so if you're pleasant, just stay around and we'll see if we can make something. Um, after looking at the reverse
will now uh, do the other way around. We will look into the microprocessor design and we will start at 